Well, hello and welcome to our January 2023 Third Thursday webinar. I am Tom Sandry and today we are going to be talking about or taking a look at investigation of cable failures at wind farms. So let's get started. Now, wind farm collector circuits in the United States comprise mostly of medium voltage cables. They are typically 35 kV rated, cross-link polyethylene or XLPE with stranded aluminum conductors, direct buried in the ground. Now, many of these cable systems have exhibited in-service problems and failures which have adversely affected wind farm operating costs and reliability. This webinar will describe the investigation of such failures at wind farms and provide a summary of the root cause analysis uh, findings. So, let's go a little bit deeper. Underground cabling is typically chosen uh, within wind farms as it is practical with regards to the dual use of the land and it's aesthetically preferred. Common circuit configurations comprise of radial feeders from the wind farm substation or collector station and daisy chain connections from one turbine to the next via switches at each step up or kiosk transformer. A feeder collector cable may have any number of turbines connected with the most heavily loaded cable being the section that runs from the substation or collector station to the first turbine. This section of the feeder uh, may be several thousands of feet long depending on the uh, substation location and may have one or more splices in it. Cable size should be graded along the feeder to match the required load. Now, Let's dig into a little bit of understanding the cable system configurations. The three cables that make up a three-phase circuit can be arranged in various formations. The most common being the trifoil or triangular and the flat formation. The choice of formation depends on several factors, including the screen bonding method, the conductor area, and the space available for the installation. Now let's talk a little bit about bonding methods. The power losses in a cabling circuit depend on the currents flowing in the metallic sheaths of the cable. Reducing or eliminating the sheath currents through bonding will allow the current carrying capacity of the cable circuit to be increased. Typical bonding methods are both end bonding, single point bonding, and or cross bonding. The simplest form of bonding for three phase single core cable consists in arranging the sheaths of the three cables to be connected together and earthed at one point only along the length as shown here. At the other end of the cable run, the cable sheaths will be terminated at an insulated fitting. If a cable screen is bonded at one side only, the following effects will appear. 1. Since the screen is open, there is no circulating current, hence, there are practically no losses in the screen and the opacity is higher compared with both sides being bonded. And two, at all other points, a voltage will appear from sheath to ground that will be a maximum at the farthest point from the ground bond. Care must be taken to insulate uh, and provide surge protection using surge voltage limiters at the free end of the sheath to avoid danger from the induced transient voltages due to lightning and switching surges as well as limiting the voltage under fault current conditions. Now the maximum sheath voltage permitted at full load varies considerably between different countries. In most cases it precludes the use of single point bonding for anything other than cable circuits of a few hundred yards in length. Now, 
Now, let's take a look at dual end bonding. A system is dual end bonded if the cable sheaths provide path for circulating currents under normal conditions. This will cause losses in the screen, which reduce the current, uh, excuse me, which reduce the cable current carrying capacity. These losses will be smaller for cables in a trifoil formation than those in a flat formation with separation. And the next bonding method we're going to take a look at is cross bonding. If the sheaths of three single core cables are not bonded electrically together, induction between conductors at each sheath will produce unacceptable voltages between sheaths. On the other hand, bonding at both ends will result in sheath currents following with associated losses, which is again not acceptable, especially for long cable routes. Cross bonding of single core cable sheaths is a technique which has been common in different countries for many years. It has been introduced in order to avoid circulating currents and excessive sheath voltages, hence increase the cable's current carrying capacity. It achieves that by dividing the cable route into three equal lengths, or six, or nine, etc and the sheath continuity is broken at each joint. The induced sheath voltage in each section of each phase are equal in magnitude and 120 degrees out of phase. When the sheaths are cross-connected, each sheath circuit contains one section from each phase such that the total voltage in each sheath circuit sums to zero as shown. Now, if the sheaths are then bonded and earthed at the end of the run, the net voltage in the loop and the circulating currents will be zero, and the only sheath losses will be those caused by eddy currents. This system provides a continuous earth path via the sheaths between the earth system at the two ends of the cable, eliminating the need for an auxiliary earth conductor. Sheath voltage limiters are connected to the earth at the intermediate cross bonding positions to dissipate any sheath voltage surges. This method of bonding allows the cable to be spaced to take advantage of improved heat dissipation without incurring the penalty of increased circulating current losses. All right, now let's take a brief overview of cable failures at wind farms. Cable failures within wind farms in the United States seems rather widespread. Based on personal experience over the past few years, uh, supporting emergency call-out uh, providers for cable circuit failures, the failures appear to be uh, coincident with the seasonal periods of high wind speeds. Furthermore, we've also noticed that in virtually all the fault locating call-outs, uh, that we've participated in during the past few years, with the possibility of one exception. All the failures had occurred at cable splices. Typically, these failures had occurred within 24 to 36 months of being put into service and being commissioned. Now, other observations have been failures typically appear uh, to occur in the first section of cable from the substation to the first turbine in the collector feeder section. In most cases, there did not appear to be any sand padding or backfill around the cables, only native fills. The most observed bonding method had been dual end bonding, and no formal cable formations seemed to have appeared. It almost looked like the trench was dug and the cables were just pushed in uh, and then covered back up. Where they fell, they fell. So let's now take a look at soil thermal resistivity. A significant source of potential problems with underground circuits is the improper selection of installation of thermal backfill materials. To prevent premature failures, you must ensure you place your cable systems in a hospitable environment. 
Now, all the heat generated by an underground power cable must be dissipated through the soil. This is quantified by the soil thermal resistivity, or thermal rho, degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt, which can vary from 30 to 500 degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt. Electrical engineers understand the performance of the cable quite well, but to most, the soil behavior is a mystery, usually handled by using a thermal backfill with a supposedly safe thermal row. The ability of the surrounding soil to transfer the heat determines whether an operating cable remains cool or it overheats. Improving the external thermal environment and accurately defining the soil and backfill thermal row commonly results in a 10% to 15% increase in cable opacity, with up to 30% improvements noted in some cases. Now, the following information has been taken from a presentation that was given by a company by the name of Geotherm Incorporated at a 2009 Insulated Conductor Committee fall meeting that was held in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, so from the material, load pattern at wind farms are significantly different from that of normal transmission and distribution, peaks and buffers. At wind farms, relatively high loads may exist for long periods during high wind months. Cable burial depths are typically relatively shallow, about maybe three feet, and therefore the earth ambient temperature can be high, uh, particularly at end of summer. Shortcuts in trenching, installation and backfilling is a major problem because most contractors do not understand or they simply ignore the importance of the thermal environment. So let's take a look at trenching, installation and backfill. Now automated single operation to plow and lay cables and to backfill with native soil is acceptable only if the resultant thermal dry out characteristic is used for the rating. Cable spacing. Vertical, horizontal, single or multiple, burial depth, etc. must be taken into consideration. For example, based on the thermal resistivity of the native soil, conductors may need to be spaced further apart to allow proper heat dissipation. Also, bonding techniques should also be looked at. Now, next, backfill. Almost all cable are directly buried and therefore native soil in most cases may not be acceptable to use as backfill. The cohesive nature will make it difficult to reinstate it to its natural condition. Presence of coarse particles like gravel may pose a serious problem and can damage the cable jacket and insulation. It seems the common practice is to use the native soil with minimum or no compaction, dump it over the cable and rely on the rain and natural settlement process to attain a density like the in pseudo condition. Now, this may happen, but not within a few months or possibly even years. Now, most moist soils, with the exception of organic clays and silts, volcanic soils, peat, and fills with ash and slag, have a row of less than 90 degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt. Moist sands, which are commonly placed around transmission cables, may even have a row of less than 50 degrees centigrade to centimeter per watt. The critical word is moist. Many soils, especially uniform sands, can dry substantially when subjected to heat from the cables. The thermal row of a dry soil would exceed 150 degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt and possibly approach 300 degrees C for a dry uniform sand. 
the dry thermal row of a properly designed and installed thermal backfill should be less than 100 degrees C to centimeter per watt and possibly as low as 75 degrees C. In fact, a contractor, if left to his or her own devices, most likely would use readily available fine sand or concrete sand as the backfill. From the construction viewpoint, this sand makes an inexpensive and excellent bedding material, but thermally, it is very poor because it dries out easily under high cable loads. Now, unfortunately, over the years, utilities have used many unsustainable sands or thermal backfills because of ease of installation and availability. Several route thermal surveys of existing circuits installed before 1980 seems to confirm this practice. Now, almost any sand, when moist, will give a reasonable low thermal row. The crucial aspect is how easily it dries when subjected to cable heat loads. Soils and semi-arid climates are naturally quite dry, so the assumption of a moist soil is not valid. It doesn't take much to dry these soils completely. In many parts of the country, the soil, mineral, uh, and consistency is such that there is a high intrinsic thermal row. Soil that is not properly compacted in the cable trench will be less dense and have a substantially higher thermal row. Even distribution or low voltage uh, cables that are continuously under full load may dry the soil. The thermal row is important not only for transmission cables, but also in any situation resulting in high heat generation. The assumption of a soil and backfill thermal row of 90 degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt may be erroneous, possibly leading to long-term problems when the cable is heavily loaded. Poorly compacted trench backfill is a major problem. Not only is the thermal row of uncompacted soil significantly higher, but the loose soil will dry more easily, which increases the possibility of thermal runaway. All right, so now let's take a look at some failed splices and the investigations and what the investigations led to. Now, each splice was opened layer by layer by a skilled engineer who was trained in medium voltage splice design, construction, and installation. Now, care was also taken during these investigations to check that the splice was installed according to the manufacturer's instructions. All the components that were supplied in these splice kits were actually used and used properly. Components were correctly positioned relative to the cable. Uh, cable preparation was correct. And connector installation was also correct. Now, before we get into the actual investigations, let's take a look at a splice and what are the components that make up a splice. So, the first we have the uh, conductor connector. Basically, joining the two conductors together to provide a continuous current carrying path. Now, this can be a crimp style connector, and with crimp style connectors, proper tool and die are important for obtaining a proper connection. You must specify either a copper or an aluminum uh, connectors. If using aluminum connectors, the installer must determine the increased length of an aluminum connector crimped with a specific tool and die. An improper crimp will create a high resistance connection, resulting in heat and a premature failure at the splice. Now another style uh, of the uh, conductor connector is the shear bolt connector. The shear bolt connector kind of takes the burden of the tool and die out of the equation. 
as we see in the illustration here, we actually have fittings that are torqued down. They are designed to shear or snap at the proper torque values. Now, this style con uh, conductor connector can be used for both aluminum and or copper, or as we see in this uh, illustration, uh, we can join an aluminum to a co uh, copper. Now, the little uh, divots uh, that are left in the conductor connector are typically covered by some means. In this particular graphic here, we show where it is a sort of like an aluminum foil wrap that goes around the body of the conductor connector, which kind of covers up the little indentations of where the shear bolts sheared off. Now, the next part of a splice body is a polymetric stress controlled layer made of semiconductive compounds serving the function as the conductor shield and it is embedded in the splice body itself. The conductor shield shields the cable insulation from any air surrounding the conductor strands. In a splice, the semiconductive layer also shields the insulation material of the splice body from any air surrounding the joint conductors. This is very important since air gaps will lead to ionization and partial discharge activity, which will prematurely fail the insulation of the splice. Now, the next part uh, of the splice body is the high quality rubber that is used to replace the cable's insulation. Next, the outer layer of the splice body serves the same function as the cable's insulation shield. It encases the splice body insulation and is composed of the same semiconductive material as the splice body's conductor shield. It serves a similar purpose as the conductor shield and shields the insulation from air that might cause ionization and partial discharge activity. Next, we have another conduct, uh, connector which joins the concentric shields together and creates a continuous uh, concentric shield throughout the splice. Covering and protecting that, we have a padding that goes on the outer body of the splice and pads against the abrasiveness of the uh, concentric neutral and the connector. And then finally, a protective sleeve or jacket that protects the entire assembly. Now, to get a little bit better visual, let's watch a video on a splice being built.
All right, now that we have a little bit better understanding of the components of a splice and how a splice is built, let's get into those splice investigations. Now, in investigation number one, the failure occurred on the first cable section between the collector uh, system station and the first turbine. Uh, approximately a seven to seven and a half mile run with over eight splices uh, in the entire uh, collector feeder system. Now the cable type was cross-link polyethylene, uh, 35 kV, uh, 1250 KC mil, and 100% insulation. The failure in this particular one had occurred about 24 months after commissioning the circuit into service. Now, the failure occurred within a splice on the A phase of the circuit. The failed splice location was tagged at about 3,000 feet from the collector station. Upon unearthing the cable, it was noted that the outer jacket on all three phases were split apart longitudinally, which typically implies an overheating. Now, also during the unearthing, the trench containing the collector cable showed only native backfill, along with debris such as pieces of excess cable stubs, shipping pallets, and sections of bobbed wire fence. I kid you not, <laughs> there was bobbed wire fence in the trench. Now, the conductors were randomly laid near one another. No real formation was identifiable. Uh, again, it just looked like they were pushed into the trench and then backfilled. The bonding method was dual end bonding. Now, all three splices were removed and repaired. All three splices were brought back to the service center where we underwent a root cause investigation on them. The splice failed at the end point, as splices are designed to do. We also exposed signs of tracking, and then the next step was to cut the splice body and peel it back from the shear bolt connector. As we peeled away the splice body, we immediately noticed that the aluminum tape had been drawn or sucked into the shear bolt recesses, and the splice body was being sucked or drawn in as well. Now, this is an indication of very high levels of heat. As the aluminum tape is drawn in, the sharp sheared edge of the bolt punctures the tape and also punctures the semiconductive layer of the splice body. Now, what is most likely to occur when a sharp conductive point protrudes into a dielectric? We establish electrical treeing and partial discharge activity. Now, further evidence of extreme heat is seen in the discoloration of the dielectric. Now, again, if you remember the video on watching the cable being assembled or the cable splice being built, typical cross-link polyethylene dielectric color is almost white in color. Look at the darkened, blackened grade and there was actually areas of the dielectric that were soft to the touch, indicating very high heat. Now, upon investigation of the other two splices, the ones that had not failed yet, we also discovered similar degradation. So, what was the probable cause of wind farm collector cable failure in investigation number one? Well, cause of failure. 
excessive heating of cable uh, which caused the shear bolt assembly to deteriorate and fail prematurely. So that bows the big question, why was there excessive heating? And going back to the client on this particular one, we collected a lot of data. One, we wanted to take a look at the load history on the circuit. Uh, what was the maximum amount of currents that the uh, circuit was carrying? And also, uh, the client was kind enough to provide us some details on the installation design requirements. Now, during the service call, upon identifying the fault of splice, we collected a soil sample at the excavation site. This sample was brought back to the service center and tested for thermal resistivity. The sample was tested using the thermal needle probe procedure as defined in ASTM D5334-14, standard test method for determination of thermal conductivity of soil and soft rock by the thermal needle probe procedure. The sensor probe was inserted into the soil sample. Prior to testing, a time period of 20 minutes was used to allow the sensor temperature to equalize with the soil sample's temperature prior to making the measurements. Three measurements were taken, allowing a soil cool down period of 30 minutes between each test. The following results were obtained. Here we see in test number one, the resistivity or thermal resistivity measured out to be 400 uh, degrees Celsius per centimeter per watt. In test number two, we reached 308 centimeter to degree Celsius per watt. And in test number three, we reached 314 centimeter to degree Celsius per watt. Now, as we can see from the test results, the native soil taken from the cable trench at the faulted splices was significantly higher in thermal resistivity value compared to the assumed 100 degrees Celsius to centimeter per watt, which was specified by the cable manufacturer for the ampacity rating of 669 amps. So the thermal row was considerably out of specification and high, which in essence caused bad heat dissipation under the high load time periods uh, when the turbines were running uh, full throttle for a long extended period of time. Even though the current that was traveling down the cable was technically within the ampacity handling of the circuit, since the uh, temperature dissipation or the heat dissipation was so poor, it created considerable heat in the splices and was the root cause of the breakdown. All right, now let's take a look at uh, cable splice failure number two and investigation number two. Now this failure occurred on the first cable section between the collector uh, system station and the first turbine. Approximately a 10 mile run with 20 splices in it. The cable type once again was cross-link polyethylene, 35 kV, uh, 1250 kC mil and 100% insulation. This failure occurred only 18 months after the commissioning test uh, and acceptance test, putting the uh, circuit into service. Now, on this particular investigation, a client had sent the splice in for a root cause analysis of failure. Uh, we were not actually part of the fault locating team and had no information on the trench conditions upon unearthing the failed splice. Now, upon uh, receiving the failed splice, we did note uh, that the jacket had split longitudinally, which again implied that there was thermal degradation.
Now, upon cutting away the cold shrink jacket that was covering the cable neutral uh, wire bundle, we immediately noticed that the conductor connector was not properly aligned in the center of the splice body. So here kind of marks the center of the splice body. And here we see that the uh, conductor connector was grossly misaligned uh, to the center of the splice body. We then located the fault point, which was located at the cable body's end transition. And here we see the conductor connector. Now, we then cut away the splice body. By examining the splice body, we got a clearer idea of what happened based on the impression of where the conductor connector was positioned and the location of the fault point. So here we can clearly see the fault point. Here we see the semiconductive material that is designed to help create a Faraday cage uh, for the conductor connector, eliminating any difference of potential, eliminating any ionization or partial discharge. In the impression, we see that that connector was misaligned to the splice body and a good portion of it was outside of the protective semiconductive region. Here we also see that there was some thermal buildup and it was beginning to cause delamination. Now, our investigation also showed that an incorrect crimp die was used on the connector and incorrect cutbacks were made on the cable. So here we see what an ideal crimp would have looked like uh, and set of cutbacks. Here we kind of see the improvised uh, cable conductor connector uh, and the cutbacks. So what was the possible cause of wind farm collector cable failure investigation number two? Simply put, poor craftsmanship. Were there other factors? Possible. But regardless of the formation that was being used, the bonding method, or soil resistivity, this splice was going to failure due to the poor craftsmanship issues. So there might have been other contributing factors that also helped accelerate uh, how quickly the splice failed. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this investigation, uh, we were not present during the unearthing, so I really can't speak uh, on what the conditions of the trench were. We were unable to get uh, soil samples to run a thermal resistivity test. But clearly in this particular one, the craftsmanship issue, issues would have eventually caused this splice to fail, even if it was placed in a hospitable environment. Now, the results of our investigation of cable splice failings in service revealed that the medium voltage cable splice designs suffer from high thermal stress that occur in the harsh loading environment uh, experienced in wind farm collector circuits. The weak spot of the design appears to be the conductor connector, regardless of its type. When working with the crimp style connectors, it is important to use the proper tool and die. Do not improvise. A poor crimp will result in a high resistance connection, which under current flow is going to create an IR drop and generate heat in that splice body. Now, the shear bolt connectors uh, present a different problem when dealing with excessive heat from harsh loading conditions. As we saw in our investigation, heat caused a vacuum and it draws the semicon of the splice body into the indents of the shear bolt. 
Now, alternative designs that use either a putty fill or caps to fill the indents may hold up better than the aluminum wrap design. However, we do not have enough evidence uh, or data to go ahead and support this theory. Also, the aluminum wrap design, if the cable was put into a hospitable environment with properly uh, engineered uh, thermal backfill with good uh, thermal dissipation, it is most probable that the suction would not have been created to the extent that we saw in the failed splices. Also, special care must be taken when setting the splice body in place and removing the core material. Do not pull straight back on that core material. It will basically bind and lock and then you forcibly pull to try to free it, you will shift the uh, splice body out of position. Now, regardless of connector type, if the core material gets caught on the connector, the result may be that the splice body being pulled, it, it will be out of alignment, thus causing the conductor uh, connector to be mislanded within the cable body. That, in investigation number two, was a large contributing factor of where the electrical treeing and tracking and eventual uh, failure uh, appeared in the splice body. And that concludes our webinar on cable failures at wind farms. I hope you enjoyed this uh, um, webinar, our first of the new 2023 year. We look forward to another great year of doing our third Thursday webinars. I do definitely appreciate all of your uh, attendance. Um, so let's make 2023 a great year and thank you for your attendance. But let's get to those questions and answers.